Uh, so let's get started. Um, thank you guys all for coming. I'm so glad to see such a big uh, crowd today. That uh, makes me really happy. Uh, and I'm glad to see a lot of new faces as well, which is always wonderful. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Erica. I'm the work coordinator. Um, and I'm also helping to run the Creative Writing Club and a couple of other writing-related projects at um, Outset. Um, so in addition to my work um, at the university, I'm also a writer myself of both fiction and nonfiction. And um, today I want to talk to you guys a little bit about um, experimental fiction, about the various shapes uh, stories can take. Um, and the goal of, of this uh, conversation and the goal of these exercises that we'll be doing together um, is really to get you um, to think more broadly about uh, what you can do with your writing, to do some experimentation, to maybe get some ideas for writers that you want to look into more and read more of their work. Um, and then hopefully also to get you excited about uh, doing your own projects and, and seeing um, what places uh, inspiration takes you. Um, so before we get started, when I say the phrase experimental fiction, what do you guys think of? Any particular writers or any particular books or any particular adjective descriptions that come to mind? For anybody? Postmodern fiction? Postmodern fiction? Yeah. So when you say postmodern fiction, what do you mean by that? Mm -hmm. I'm just saying, uh, I remember reading the uh, this work when you when they see really experimental with a format, um, how the writing should be and how it should be reading. Because I, I was forgetting um, the name of his book, but I just like, remember that it's William Burrow, and one book he just like reordered the already. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so William Burrow is a sort of famous sort of experimental writer, and as you mentioned, a lot of experimental works experiment with how the words are arranged on the page, how things look, how things <laughs> relate to each other. Absolutely. What else? Anything else? Oh, I think Jack Kerouac's books might be considered as an experiment. Okay, in what way? Uh, he tried with this this new style of, of jazz writing, mm -hmm. turning his prose to kind of poetry and music. Mm -hmm. okay. So he's sort of experimenting with how sentences sound, yeah. right? How words go together, the rhythms, right? So not just the layout, but the, the sound, right? Anything else? Any other authors or books or um, examples that come to your mind when you think of experimental fiction? So I think that writing can be experimental in a lot of ways. We talked about formatting, we talked about flow, um, it can be experimental in terms of um, the psychology of the characters, right? An unreliable narrator is a uh, frequent sort of uh, staple of postmodern fiction, as, as Denise mentioned. Um, so I'm going to focus on three areas that you can experiment with and give some examples. And I want to talk about what you think about these experiments, whether you think they're successful or unsuccessful, and also how these changes that authors make, how these choices that authors make, affect you as a reader. And I think through understanding this, through understanding how the shape of a short story affects the reader, we can begin to make conscious decisions about our own writing. So even if we decide not to follow these experiments, we are doing it consciously because we understand you know, what our sentences do, how our sentences feel. So the first area that I want to look at, the first sort of type of experimentation that I want to look at in short stories is what I call scale. So by that I mean um, both the scale of sentences, the lengths of sentences, for instance, but also the lengths of the stories themselves. Um, so the first example that I want us to look at, and I'm sorry that it's a little bit small, is from a very famous short story by Jamaican Cade, who's actually one of my former professors. Uh, the story is called Girl. And it was published in The New Yorker magazine. And it's um, more or less one page. So it's, it's quite short. And it's all, well, it's all one sentence, right? It's a very, very long sentence. The entire thing is sort of continuous monologue. Um, can I have a volunteer to maybe read, let's say, I'll read half of this, because it's kind of long. 
Yeah, what's your name? Uh, maybe I'll tell you. Okay, could you please uh, uh, ask me? Uh, yes. Um, uh, J Jamaica, uh, can you talk girl? Wash the white clothes on Monday and put them on the stone heap. Uh, wash the colored clothes on the Tuesday and put them on the uh, clothes line to dry. Don't walk here, heat in the hot sand, cook pumpkins, uh, fritters, and every and very hot sweet oil. Soak your little clothes right after you are take them off. When buying cotton on the make yourself a nice clothes. Be sure that it doesn't have uh, gam in it because uh, that way it won't hold up well. After a wash, uh, salt, salt fish overnight before you cook, cook it. Uh, is it true that you sing uh, Bina in Sunday school? Always eat your food in such a way that you won't turn someone else's stomach. On Sunday, try to, um, try to walk uh, like a lady and not, uh, and not like this uh, slot. You are so bent and becoming. Don't sing uh, Bina in Sunday school. You mustn't speak uh, too warm, red bites, uh, not even to give in direction, not eat fruits on the street. Uh, flies uh, will follow you, but I don't sing Bina on Sundays at all, and never in Sunday school. Okay, I'm going to ask you to stop there just because it's quite long. But thank you for reading. Okay. So, who is talking to who in this? Yeah, it's, it's a monologue. And, and it's, sorry, it's who, who is speaking to who? Uh, so the writer is speaking over the girl. So, um, when when we're reading stories and we're reading poems, I think it's important to separate the writer mm -hmm. from the person who is speaking, right? So, it might say like, you know, I did this, I did that, but it's not necessarily the writer doing that, right? Yeah. So, sorry, girl, girl, the girl. So is the girl speaking, or is the girl being spoken to? Spoken to. Being spoken to, right? And who do you think is speaking to her? The also, the mother. The mother, so, yeah. yeah. The mother of this girl is is giving her instructions, advice. Right? advice, yeah. How to do this, how to do that, how to wash her clothes, how to cook certain things, how to buy certain things, right? And at a certain point, right at the end of the part that you read. The girl speaks, right? She says, but I don't sing Bena, which is the of Sundays, on Sunday schools. So it's slightly a conversation, but yeah. most of the mostly the advice. Mostly the advice. So it seems like from this, it's a list of instructions, but you can kind of tell something about their relationship, right? Uh, How would you describe their relationship? Uh, it's really true. Well, there seems pretty strict, right? It's all commands, right? Yeah. All telling her what to do. do. This, do, not do this. Exactly. Any other observations about what you can tell about their relationship? The mother don't know pretty good her daughter because, as we can see, that made also bad in some while the mother said, "Don't think bad in some school." Only talks about it. Her mother don't know the much. Yeah, so maybe the mother is making assumptions about what the girl does and doesn't want to. I, I get the feeling when I read this that the relationship is not super positive, right? There is an element of control, right? And I would also say that one of the ways that you get this effect is because it's just this one long string of words, right? If it were divided, it would feel different. But because it's all this one sentence that never ends, you get this feel of it sort of mounting on top of it, right? So through this choice, the author is able to heighten a certain effect and is able to give us uh, a view to the characters and to their relationship, even though the author never says, you know, the mother was very strict, the girl, you know, didn't like her mother, etc. So we can tell things about it in an indirect way through these choices that the author makes. Um, uh, the next type of scale that I want to talk about, and I apologize, it might be a little bit hard to read, um, is the short, short stories of Lydia Davis. Has anybody heard of Lydia Davis? So Lydia Davis is an American, I think she's an author and
translator. She's very famous for translating French fiction and poetry into English, but she's also a fiction writer for herself, and she's extremely famous for, for her extremely, extremely short stories. So I have put here three complete short stories here. This is the beginning and the end of them, right? This is not just a part of them. Um, does someone want to read the stories for us? Maybe someone close to the screen who can see it more easily. Denise, do you mind? Um, okay. So, okay. an old burst of anger near the road, a refusal to speak on the path, a silence in the pine woods, a silence across the old railroad bridge, and nothing to be friendly in the water, a refusal to again their hand on the flat stones, a cry of anger on the steep bank of dirt, a weeping among the bushes. Okay, um, so before you move on, can someone explain what this story is about? What this sentence is about? What happens? It's an anger near the road. Yeah, so it seems like they're going on some kind of trip and there's a there's a fight. And within this single sentence, which is the entire short story, you can get the whole the story, the whole story, right? The whole arc of the story. Right? So she writes these very small things, but within it, you can uh, you can see an, an entire day, an entire relationship, right? It's a very interesting choice that she makes. Um, Denise, would you mind reading the next one? Okay. Um, of behavior. You see how circumstances are to blame. I'm not really not person if I put more and more small pieces on shredded clinics in my ears and tie a scarf around my head when I lived alone. I had all the silence in the What do you guys think of this one? So Kleenex, for those who don't know, it's like tissues. It's like the stuff you wipe your nose with. Yeah. Like you tear that up, which makes it worse. Does anybody like this one or, or dislike it or think it's not a story? I just think a little bit dinner, so it's just like small pieces of shredded wig, so it just like from the boots, but she puts it in her ears. Mm -hmm. Kleenex is for the boots. Kleenex is like tissues, like for your nose. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. It's difficult to say two names as a story. Because it's so fast. Yeah. What do you think? Uh, I think it's. Uh, and some of like speech that uh, say the about person. Mm -hmm. like, it doesn't nice. look like much like a story. I think. I think it's the person just uh, told this one for themselves, for mm -hmm. himself, and uh, they just blame around his behavior or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, um, the short story is so it's the way that um, about the characters. So it explains what the characters are what, what she needs to do for the situation that she is right now. It's a part of it. Yeah. So you think it's not it doesn't feel complete to you? You wish it was not there? It's not the complete. No. It doesn't yeah, go ahead. I guess the point is to imagine the circumstances. Yeah. And uh, this the gap, the discrepancy between between the title, the odd behavior. And her own, uh, the hero's protagonist's own position that she's not odd, that she's being labeled or blamed as having an odd behavior, being odd. Uh, well, I, I like it very much. Okay. Yeah. So we have some some uh, people who don't think it, it feels complete, some some defenders. Okay. It's more to see. Um, I don't know, I think this might be a short story it's more about immersion or diving into the character. Because, um, as you mentioned already, you see, you can actually feel what the character thinks, especially you see, I say, I'm not really an old person if I put more and more small pieces of strange clinics in my ears. So it's about how you, you can understand from that that she's actually showing and not telling uh, the reader how she perceives herself and she needs to hide because of how actually society perceives you. Yeah, so to me, uh, Lydia Davis's short stories 
feel like um, you know these these sketches by author or by um, artists like Picasso, where you know it's just a few lines, but you can see a horse or a man or a face. It's true that it's very short, but in the details she chooses, you get something very specific, something that you remember. This thing like cutting tissues in your ear. It's a, it's a small detail, but it's so strange that, that you do remember it. And I think this role of imagination is very important as well. She leaves room for us to imagine, right? When I lived alone, I had all the silence I needed. That's a sentence that asks you to imagine a lot, right? So um, I, I think that these stories are very thought are very thought provoking. They they require you to imagine a lot, but they keep you thinking about them for a long time, maybe even longer than if they had given you the answers to the questions that they raise. So I think she's a very interesting interesting writer in this way. Let's read one last uh, short short story by her, um, Denise. Would you mind? Okay. Um, last things. They are lost, but also not lost, but somewhere in the world. Most of them are small, though two are larger, one a cold, and one a dog. For the small things, one is a certain ring, one is a certain bar. They are lost from me and where I am, but they are also not gone. They are somewhere else, and they are there, and they are there to someone else, it may be. But if not there to someone else, the ring is still not too lost to itself. But they're only not where I am. And the bottom, too, they're still only not where I am. What do you guys think about this one? It's, um, it's about the uh, thing that was um, lost. Like, uh, it, uh, we lost our like, thing that is um, ours, but. Um, uh, it still uh, lives in our memories, and we can remember about it. But uh, in but nowadays it can be um, the other people can uh, like, uh, how to say can prevent by me. For instance, uh, I have a pen, mm -hmm. and uh, it's mine. But if I lost it, uh, I still remember it because it's it was uh, uh, it was mine, and it will live now in my mind. But uh, actually now it's uh, it's um, someone use it, and yeah. So it's, it's basically saying that these things that are lost, they're not really lost, right? Mm -hmm. If I lose my dog, I might be very sad and like, you know, where is my dog? But that dog might be living a great life and not think of itself as lost, right? It has itself, right? It lives in and of itself. To itself, it is not lost. Only to me is it lost, right? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, can you say that a bit louder? Um, you say, I really like the last one because, uh, you know, this, this idea is it what defines the object, mm -hmm. is it because I own it or it's more about its true essence and mm -hmm. what is this essence and there just exist different you know, types. I just think really like how it was connected that it's not only for me but also to someone else and if this someone else also to say gonna oh, lose it, it's not for you say he or she either. And I just think really like the structure because it's it makes you think, not yeah. only just like, it's not like passive reading, it's mm, like you absorb and then just you produce something new out of your own thoughts. Yeah, I like that. that it, um, it does demand something of the reader, right? You're not just being taken on a, on a journey. It does require you to be active and, and, and really think. But I would also say that there are great rewards to these short stories. That they, they make you think in a really Pleasant. To me, pleasant. Interesting way. Any other thoughts? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, she making a conscious choice of calling this uh, stories. Because, uh, I mean, all right, the first two, uh, that's a classic story, a narrative, yeah. that would be a, a biography. But 
this is a, like a philosophical musing. It's a poetry, more or less, I would imagine. Yeah, I think you're right to point out the, the differences here, right? Like the first one has why a narrative. Do, why do do yeah, the first one has a narrative. Just the last one doesn't really have a narrative. Um, as to whether it's your question, whether it's a conscious choice, I think, yeah. uh, of course, yes. Um, uh, did you, sorry, did you have an, uh, a deeper question than you? Yeah, no, uh, I mean, what, what, what's, what's the point? What's the point of that? Mm -hmm. uh, is, it, is it to create uh, a little whirlpool in the genre? Uh, like, mm -hmm. I don't know, like Proust, yeah? Mm -hmm. Because this is like Proust, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, like five volumes of, of, of this. Uh -huh. Yeah, but uh, what, what, what was her, well, because I'm not familiar with her uh, over, mm -hmm. so uh, is she writing all of her work this way, or she's just trying to subverse the genre? What was the point? I think you're you're right that her uh, her innovation is not just mm -hmm. about form, mm -hmm. right? It's not just about length, but it's also about content. What we can call a story. Um, as to what her what her goal is, I can't really say. But I think it's interesting that you make the comparison to Proust because she does translate a lot of classic French literature. I can't recall off the top of my head if she has translated Proust, but I know she has translated like Flaubert. She has translated um, Rimbaud, who is a very famous, like very innovative writer. So I think it's certainly quite possible that she is um, engaging with exactly these kinds of questions. So it's, uh, it might it might seem as a you know, continuation of communication with Rainbow. Sure, why not? I, I don't know. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, and, and then because people buy the package of a story, and then they have Rainbow inside, yeah, yeah. which is pretty cool, yeah. I think. So Rainbow, for those who don't know, is a very famous French poet. He was very, very young. He started writing poetry when he was a teenager. And then, uh, quite abruptly, he sort of stopped, and then he moved I think he moved to Yemen or something, and he became to Mali. To Mali, Mali Senegal, and uh, Mauritania. Yeah, and he uh, he stopped writing poetry. So he had a very brief, very very bright career, and then he sort of dropped off the map. So he's a very very interesting figure in poetry. So if you're interested, I encourage you to look him up. Yeah, because he made it the fact that other people were telling him that he invented the whole movement of symbolism. Yeah. When he came back uh, to Berlin. And they met on the San Lazar uh, train station and said, Dude, we published three volumes of your, uh, of your work. Do you know that you transform literature in the world? He said, I, I don't care. He turned around and <laughs> went back <laughs> straight to Mali. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let's see the name So his name is Rambo, uh, R I M B A U D. It's his last name. And his most famous book is called A Season in Hell. Mm -hmm. In Hell? You, in Hell. Do you have any particular poems by him that you would recommend people read? Oh, the Papua Leaf, the, the, the drum sheet. The drum sheet. It's drunken boat, yeah. The drunken boat, yeah, that's correct. Uh, yeah. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's an absolutely mm -hmm. And it, it's totally deserves to transform world literature. Mm -hmm. And to legitimize certain kinds of behavior, because the, you know the world was changing, the republic, uh, the, the empire and republic were clashing over the ideals, and uh, they needed a new language to express the, this new aesthetic vision. Mm -hmm. uh, when the impressionists were persecuted, when the symbolists were persecuted, uh, when uh, Flaubert was put in jail for indecency, yeah, so it it was uh, so important. But at the same time, uh, he was in himself a very controversial figure because his dream was to get uh, one million francs in gold. Yeah, so the, the anti-bourgeois becoming an ultimate bourgeois. So, but uh, apparently, the world needed such a figure you know, to say that uh, you know, look at me, uh, my queer uh, identity and my queer behavior is something that hasn't been seen, uh, hasn't been seen before, and didn't really actually have a language to express itself. So, uh, uh, we're a revolutionary nonetheless. What is your name, sir? Uh, Asan. Asan. So I think Asan raised an important point here, which is that um, revolutions in literature are often political in nature, right? They are uh, 
not merely the result of, but also often commentaries on what is going on in society, uh, whether it is a commentary on class, is a reaction to war. After World War I, for instance, we see a lot of revolutions in visual arts, revolutions in literature. And so I think it's important to think about the social context of works of art, of works of literature, and how the way they look, the way they are written, what they are about, is connected to the world that they came from, and maybe also the world that their authors want to create. Um, all right, so continuing with this uh, theme of scale, I want to uh, in, uh, include this piece, For Sale, Baby Shoes Never Worn. Has anybody ever read this before? Hemingway. Hemingway, yeah. yeah. So can you talk about this? Um, it's just, uh, it's just important to mention it's a word of the but uh, yeah. Uh, you see, Hemingway was really, really experimenting with the style and with the short stories, and so he wanted um, maybe to challenge himself and created the shortest story possible, and this is actually the short story itself. So. <laughs> yeah, so in this, in this, I mean, it's not even a full sentence, right? You can imagine the family expecting the baby. You can imagine the grief. All of this, it, it makes you work, as we were talking about before, but, you know, in these six words you feel such a range of emotions, right? The expectation, the happiness, and the deep sadness of this miscarriage or baby dying. Um, okay, so this is a very famous sort of example of a six-word uh, six novel or six-word short story. Uh, it's often called, and it sort of spawned a lot of people trying to write similar things, these word stories. So as a little uh, activity or challenge, I wanted to take just a few minutes to try to do this ourselves, to try in six words to write a story. So let's take it just a few minutes to do it. It's been a couple of minutes. Um, can I ask anybody, anybody want to share what they wrote? Any one of their six word stories, six word novels? No, because it's more than six words. <laughs> it was it's more than six words. That's the slightly cheating, but you can <laughs> share it anyway. It can be any story. Yeah, I can still be. Love story, hate story, death story, war story. Uh, in the perfect world, say we put together. <laughs> It's a little bit long, but okay. okay. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah. A man, his dreams, unfair world. A man, his dreams, and unfair world. Unfair world. Okay. Thank you. So that's six. There we go. Anybody um, else? Um. A ship. Ship. A ship. Uh, sails around the world. Okay. So okay. Interesting. You were reading yeah. Around the World in 80 Days. <laughs> I think you're inspired by Jules Verne. Yeah. Uh, anybody else? Yeah, so far, you will, you want. So far, you will, you want. Uh, begin a new adventure. 
began a new adventure. Let us forward. <laughs> You're even shorter than I am. Okay, uh, begin a new adventure of life. Okay, so there we have a This is like a command for Tom Okay. Any comment on yourself? Altruism, a personal choice, or forced. Okay, so this is even shorter than my head. Okay. Anybody else want to share or shall we keep going? Shall I? Yeah, please add that. Okay, uh, <clears throat> actually it's eight words. Add <laughs> <laughs> you kill me. Go okay, ahead. But, but it was, okay, I'll just read. He locked the door, now with six bodies hidden in it. Oh, this is like, a, do you know the story of Bluebeard? Uh, no. Oh, uh, no. This is who murdered his wives. Yeah, so that he had a uh, room in his house that he said, you know, I marry you, I give you all these riches, but you can never go in this room. Um, and whenever, every time his wife is, would get curious and he would go in, it would be all the bodies of his other wives. Tell her. Who also just say cooked and it's a Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, very interesting. All right, anybody else or shall we keep going? I have four words. <laughs> four words. I'm very sure. Okay. Um, strangers, friends, lovers, strangers. Okay, interesting. So that was, so this it takes uh, on our Very good stuff. All right. Um, so let's keep going. Oh, hi. I did this. Uh, the girl who dreams and accomplishes. The girl who dreams and accomplishes. Okay, interesting. Thank you. Oh, yeah, please. Yeah. Well, I, I, I need so much. Uh, return to the normal, comfortable strange effort. Oh, the last word, it sort of turns the whole thing. Do you guys know what a straight jacket is? Can you explain what a straight jacket is? Uh, it's, a, it's a garment that is used to constrain uh, mental patients. Um, so it stops them from being able to move. If people yeah. have mental illness and they might hurt themselves, I don't think they use them nowadays, but. They used to put them in jackets so that they couldn't move their arms. Mm -hmm. It was crushed the arms. Yeah, yeah. Sleeves, yeah. Yeah, exactly. They sort of tie them. Um, all right, so thank you guys. I hope that was interesting. I hope it was challenging, but interesting. Um, all right, so we've talked about skill. Now I want to talk about uh, perspective. So who the narrator is um, and how different narrators can give us uh, different uh, feelings in our writing. Um, so the first examples I want to look at are from a book that we've talked about at the book club, if any of you guys come to the book club. But it's a book by the Turkish writer Orhan Pamuk, and it's called My Name is Greg. Uh, and it's a novel about a murder, but uh, all of the different sections are told from different perspectives, and not merely from human perspectives, right? So the first narrator is uh, I am a corpse, right? I'm a dead body. And it's the dead body telling the story of uh, how it was murdered, basically. And then you get all these different perspectives on what happens. Um, can I get someone to read I am a tree and I am a dog? Yeah, please. Uh, Orhan Pemuk, my name is Ray. I am a tree. I am a tree and I am quite lonely. I live in the rain. For the sake of Allah, listen to what I have to say. Drain down to your coffee so your sleeper uh, abandons you and your eyes uh, open wide. Stare at me as you would uh, at James and let me explain to you why I am so alone. I am a, a dog. As you can uh, doubtless uh, tell dear friends, my kidneys are so long uh, and they're painted that they barely fit uh, into my mouth. The kidneys are the teeth. The kinens, uh, the kinens are so long and painted they uh, barely fit uh, into my mouth. I know this gives me a, a menacing uh, appearance, uh, but uh, it uh, places me noticing the size of my teeth. A butcher once uh, had a dog to see. My God, that's no dog at all. It's uh, a web. Uh, yeah, so uh, well, has anybody read? Um, my name is Red, and can we talk about it or comment on it? No. Have you read it? Long, long time ago. Long time ago? Yeah. What did you think about it? What did you think about Humbug's use of these different perspectives? Well, uh, I cannot remember uh, exactly the, the 
passages, uh, neither the techniques, but I was uh, at the time into Kafka and Kutagawa. So uh, I was like, he's just ripping off this whole Kutagawa techniques uh -huh. thing, so it's not that great. Uh, but th that's why I, I did not give all the credit, I think. I gotta agree with you. So uh, I should just uh, refrain. So Akutagawa, who you mentioned, Akutagawa Rinosuke is a very famous Japanese writer of short stories. He's very famous for his like creepy, like horror short mm -hmm. stories. And probably his most famous story is called In a Grove. But it was turned into a movie by like the most famous Japanese director called Nashomo. And this story is also about a murder, but it's um, you know witnesses telling what happened from their perspectives, but none of the perspectives, like they all conflict. They can't all be true, right? Um, so it's this sort of classic story and classic movie about subjectivity, right? What you think is real versus what is really real, that kind of thing. Um, and Pamuk is also playing with this, right? But I think he takes it in a different direction, right? It's not just about human subjectivity or ghost subjectivity, because there's a ghost in that movie um, and story. Um, but it's also sort of playing with, um, uh, you know, I'm a tree, I'm a dog, I'm a vase, etc., etc. I think this is difficult to pull off, right? Uh, sometimes when you do these things, like I'm going to tell a story from my cat's perspective, uh, it winds up making kind of uh, cliche uh, observations about human nature. I think this is sort of the, the trap of this kind of narration. But if done well, if you really allow yourself to um, get into what is it like to be a tree, what is it like to be a cat, or whatever, um, then I think that it, it could be interesting. So it's a challenging technique, but it is it is a, a one that could lead to some surprising places. Uh, yeah. So you mentioned cliches. So how do you think what can be applied to this story? For example, we're using the perspective of the object. For example, if I'm describing the world from the cat's perspective, what would be a cliche? Does anybody have a response to that? Can we miss something? Um, should I repeat the question? No, no, no we don't have to. Okay. I understood. So, I think that if you use the perspective of a cat to say, like, oh, aren't humans greedy? Or, oh, aren't humans, you know, don't they have a bad nature or something like that? And I think it's not so interesting, right? Because you can, uh, I think that uh, in for children there is a fair, how to say, fairy tale, fairy tales, and most of them are uh, like uh, describes the animals instead of like animals, but uh, in reality it's the uh, people, right? Yeah, and it will be like the same if we if you gonna write a uh, from. Story from the dog's perspective, mm -hmm. and it will be look like fairy tale. Yeah, so I think uh, right in fairy tales, the goal of the fairy tale is to teach usually kind of a simple lesson to children. And the danger I think with using this technique is that it can feel like you're trying to simplify society and teach what is basically a simple lesson about humans, um, and you know, give a kind of a, a simple lesson about society. So I think it's important, if using this technique, not to sacrifice complexity, not to sacrifice um, your vision. Um, all right, let's move on. So another author that I wanted to talk about is a French author named uh, Raymond Cuneau, uh, who I really like. Um, some of his, his books have been turned into movies, if, if you're interested. He's a very playful writer. Uh, his books are very, uh, uh, very fun to read, um, but also he does a lot of, of innovation. And he wrote a book that uh, I really like called Exercises in Style, um, where he takes a very simple story about a man riding a bus. On the bus, he sees you know two people kind of fight over a seat. You know, someone steps on somebody's foot, and then later on, he sees you know one of these same people, right? Nothing really happened, nothing is exciting. But what is interesting about this book is it's the same story told over and over and over again in different ways, 
right? So sometimes he writes it as a poem. Sometimes he writes it as an opera. Sometimes he writes it using only um, uh, sounds or only um, you know words that uh, come from a certain language, etc. So he's being very playful with it. And the point is not the story. The point is is the retelling of the story and, and what these different perspectives or these different styles um, add to it or, or change about it. Um, so this is a bit long. Can someone just read the first paragraph of Negativities? Yeah, please. Um, it was neither a boat uh, nor an uh, airplane, uh, but the um, terrestrial. terrestrial meaning of transport. It was uh, neither in the morning nor the evening, but may, uh, maybe. It was neither a baby or an old man, but a young man. It was neither a ribbon nor a strain, uh, but a plate cord. It was uh, neither a procession nor a brow, but a it was uh, neither a pleasant person nor an evil person, but a bad temperate person. It was neither a truth nor a lie or a uh, pretext. It was neither a standard person nor a uh, resembant person, but a recumbent uh, person, but a would be stated person. Thank you. So here, negativity is right. It's saying it's not this, it's not that, it's not this, mm -hmm. right? So it's, it's interesting, it's fun, right? It's not usually how we talk or write, but it's, it's pretty interesting. Um, and play, right? Uh, all right, let's read another one. Hellenisms. So Hellenisms is all words that come from Greek, some of which are made up. <laughs> so they don't exist. So if you don't understand it, uh, it's totally fine. Um, can someone just read maybe the first sentence of this? So I'll read it. Uh, in a hyper omnibus full of petrol nuts, in a crania of meta rush, I was a martyr to this micro -rama, a more than icosymmetric hypotype with a pedicist paracycled by a caloplyma and a youth cylindrical macrotrachea, and thus anathematized an ephemeral and an and anonymous utis who ace the pseudologue had been epitreting his bipods. But as soon as he uroscoped as Cenotopia, he had paratroped and catapulted himself onto it. Okay, so this is, I mean, it's kind of absurd. It's but it's confusing, yeah, confusing right? Because these are not people real words. But it's funny, right? It's fun, right? He's really playing with language. And he's, he's putting on these um, kind of absurd uh, constraints in order to, to uh, have fun with, with how you write. Um, all right, uh, let's read one more. Just, uh, can someone just read like maybe the first three lines of this? Exclamations. Yes, please. Goodness, 12 o'clock. Time for the bus. What a lot of people. What a lot of people. Aren't we squashed? Bloody fighting. The chap. What a face. And what a neck. Two foot long. The least. And the court. The court. I haven't seen it. The court. That's a bloody fight. Oh. Okay, thank you. So yeah, you, you sort of get the point, right? He's yeah. doing it in a lot of different ways. And I think it's, I think it's like, really fun. All right, I'm going to skip this one for the same time. Um, so another task I want us to try is to think about your own journey to out today and try writing it in two, two different styles. Um, try to think of it a one that you didn't see with Kuno. So maybe you can write it as a, I don't know, looking at different senses or in a specific style of a certain text or something like that. So let's just take a couple minutes and try it and see what it reveals to us about how different styles feel when they do. Wasn't he friends with uh, his parents? Yes, and, he was. Uh, uh, yes. uh, story without using yeah, yeah, with only yeah, yeah, yeah. and with, without people, the, f the things, the shows, yeah. all that was so cool. Yes, it, it was, was like cooler than than Bangkok, I think. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and, and and lately they made the made an animated movie, Friends uh, About the Hand. Uh, and have you seen it? No. Uh, I, I think it's called I Lost My Body. Uh, it's on, it's oh, on Netflix. It's so beautiful. So it's based on the parents' story. 
well, not. It's 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 an original it's script, uh, but it's perfectly in the line of Peric's thinking mm -hmm. about uh, how the hand, which is part of our body, which is so natural, uh, part of our body, can actually have the life of its own. At the same time, try to relive our human experience inside of this uh, limited stump of, uh, of a body. So, but it's a delicious love song. At the same time, it was from the perspective of the hand. Yeah, yeah, everything. Yeah. everything. So, how a hand, a real physical hand, would live in the real Paris of the 21st century, which is gross and creepy sometimes, yeah. but uh, none, nonetheless. nonetheless. Yeah, so Kudo was fight of a lot of famous realists and artists mm -hmm. called Ulipo, yeah. which was uh, trying to write with very specific strict rules, not using certain letters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But personal Kevin, I think, is the most fun. Yeah, but I like his, I mean, his style is so beautiful. Yeah. But, uh, so, magical, miraculous cities. Um, invisible cities. Yeah, invisible cities. That is absolutely mind blowing. Uh, and we were reading it at the anthropology of uh, urban anthropology mm -hmm. because uh, his way of describing uh, the structure and the living experience of the city is, uh, is unparalleled. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, invisible cities are great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, all right, does anybody have. Uh, a, an exercise in style that they would like to share about their morning commute. Anybody? Be, be very short. No? Alright, let's give it one more minute. Alright, um, does anybody want to share theirs or wrap up? Share? Last time, do you want to share yours maybe? Yeah, I have some. But I think it would be kind of uh, not so comprehensible. Not so comprehensible? Yeah. Okay. It's like, just, just uh, excuse me if, if you don't understand. So, what style are you reading? Okay, it's kind of a um, style from the first uh, perspective, kind of I. Yeah, uh, and this is sort of the reflection of the thought that come while you're pacing. Okay. Yeah. okay. Oh God, 10 o'clock, my room had gone, bastard didn't wake me up, Jesus Christ, for the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Ha, <laughs> school. Okay. <laughs> Interesting. So it's sort of a time, time warp <laughs> from getting up to school. Okay. Interesting. Anybody else want to share theirs? Please? Um, okay. Play. Fast. Not stairs. Elevator. Run. Apologize. Traffic jam. Queue. Run. First. So what, if you were to give it a title of the style, what would, what would the title be? My typical morning. My typical morning? <laughs> okay. Sounds like that. Um, I don't know, just think. Uh, today it was something like um, I woke up later than they thought, and 
I was actually just saying on Harry at this moment when this poem slow happens and you just say everyone is going much more slower than usual so you're coming to the shop and there's nobody on the cashier and you're just like trying to not to be late but actually become the first to the university. Mm -hmm. So to me, it hurts you kind of to a style. It feels like a list. So it feels like yeah. bullet points. Oh, yeah. 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 Something like that, right? And so we can think about how that would feel very different if you were as full, very long, very rich sentences, right? Mm -hmm. The same thing, feel very different. Um, all right. Uh, so let's keep going for the sake of time. The last type of experimentation that I want to talk about is experimentation in form. So Canal is kind of four kind of perspectives. Um, but anyway, by form, what I mean is the shape that a piece takes. So maybe it's a story written as a series of receipts for the things that a, a character buys. Or you know, maybe it's a story told as a series of, of um, letters, which is a very classic form of the novel. It's called an epistolary novel, story told as letters. Um, so how uh, a story is told, what form it takes, obviously has a huge and um, let's look at some examples of, of uh, authors who are uh, playing with form. So the first thing I want to look at um, is an American writer named Carmen Maria Machado. So she recently came out with a, uh, well, she recently came out with her second book, but two years ago, she came out with her first book of short stories, which uh, is called Her Body and Other Parties. It's kind of interesting title. But she's very known for her sort of creepy um, stories that, that take uh, very interesting forms. So often she's inspired by um, like classic horror stories or classic tropes from, uh, from horror. Uh, in this case, uh, the story, especially heinous, is told um, as a series of uh, television detective show synopses. So sometimes, like for instance, in the newspaper, uh, at least in my hometown, it will give like the title of an episode of a show that is on today and then the, the like, synopsis, the summary of that episode. So it's told as like a, a complete list of these for the whole show. Um, but through this list, um, you, you learn about the characters and, and it's uh, similar, I think, to Lydia Davis in that it asks you to fill in a lot, just like these summaries, they don't tell you what happens. But you know, you, you come to imagine it, and it becomes, I think, more disturbing, more creepy than if she had given you these whole stories. Um, does someone want to read these, please? Yeah, go ahead. You're a uh, uh, queen reader today. <laughs> no, okay. Uh, Carmen Maria uh, Machado, especially Daniels, uh, Bad Blood, Stabler, and Benson will never forget the cause where this, the outcome was so much worse than the crime. The third guy, Stablo, never told the Bunsen about his little brother, but he also never told her about his older brother, which he was more acceptable because he didn't know about him either. Stolen first, it's the candy bar, the next day a, lad a lighter. Stabler wants to stop, but he has long since learned to choose his path. Yeah. What do you guys think about this? Do you have any observations, any thoughts? Is it interesting, or do you think it's, it's still... Somehow interesting. It's somehow interesting. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Just like it's intriguing. I just like, really like this style of synopsis. Like you know, when the it's the job of the reader to match the story, and it becomes. I think that what is, you know, great and adorable about the stories is that it's more interesting. I like you know art exhibitions mm -hmm. when just like different people come to some. You know, more in arts, and they start seeing, and someone will, um, you know, express it. You know, this, this art just it makes me feel calm, while others will say, "Oh, oh my God, I just I can't stand it. I feel just, like, so much fear out of this picture." And I think the same. For example, with Bad Blood, if you know, one person would imagine one outcome, so just like what would be worse than the crime. And you describe his own story, while if you ask another uh, reader, she would describe it completely another way based on their background and experience. And I think it would be much more interesting to, you know, to hear what readers think about the stories and the story itself. And this is, you know, a communication between the reader and the writer. It's really very engaging and astonishing. 
Yeah, I really recommend uh, this. It's a story, especially heinous. It's quite long for a short story, but it's very, it's very, very interesting. Um, does, do any of you guys watch Law and Order? SVU. So it's a real television show, and she's taken. Um, these are characters from this real television show that she's sort of playing with. So it sort of starts out very similar to this, the stories that they see, and then it gradually gets weirder and weirder and sort of more disturbing. So I think especially if you, if you know the, the show, which is a very famous show, what she does with it is uh, very interesting. But, um, she's, a very, she's a very cool writer. Um, I really enjoy her stuff. Um, full name is called 272. Views of law and order. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So she's actually writing the whole thing. It's like the, it's like the, yeah. So it's two hundred and seventy-two of these, mm -hmm. but it's 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 really good. It's really interesting. So, so it's like uh, as uh, in these days, as Denise said, uh, it might serve as a Rorschach test for, yeah, for, yeah, the, yeah, for yeah. the reader. Yeah. yeah. It's because it's an abstract ink blot. But what comes out, it's your fears, it's your old Freudian mm -hmm. <laughs> outlook. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So she, yeah, it's very cool. Um, Alright, and then the last author that I want to look at is a Chilean writer named Alejandro Sandra. So um, he grew up uh, at a time when his country, Chile, was under a military dictatorship, supported by the US government. Um, and, uh, one of the things that his writing is really interested in looking at is not merely the politics of Chile and the history of this dictatorship, but also the relationship between um, dictatorship and education, the relationship between power and education. Um, so I think the book where he makes this connection most clear is his book Multiple Choice, which is basically a parody of the um, like high school exit exam that he had to take uh, as, as a student. Um, so he basically writes these stories as tests, but sort of what he wants to get at is um, the history of Chile and specifically um, the role that the education system played in supporting the dictatorship. Um, so can I get a volunteer to read these, um, the multiple choice section here? So this is like the first section of the test, the book, where he just gives a word, and you have to pick which is which is the um, word that doesn't match, which is the word that doesn't belong. Choice, voice, line, position, reference, alternative. Can you read the others as well, please? Uh, body, dust, age, still, great, small, smart, smart, teach. Uh, Preach, uh, control, educate, uh, initiate, speech. What do you What do you guys think about this? I think it's like when you're looking for the word in the scissors, just like for scissors. Yes, scissors. And then I'm going to say, looking at your depending on the context of what you are writing, for example, if I'm googling you know, the word or the translation of the word, and then there are just like this several meaning, and depending on the context in which you are writing, different word, the same word can mean different things. And so it's the same, I think, based on the, like the previous other like, comment, uh, I think depending on the readers, it's the reader who actually doing anything. Not the writer itself, just the reader decides what to understand from the screen. Do you think that the writer is trying to lead us in a particular direction? Uh, I think it's really felt when there is this teach part mm -hmm. because he feels just like preach, control, educate, initiate, and preach. And he just like giving, it's not really very neutral, they're either very positive or negative when it comes. For example, if He's saying just like preach or control. It's basically some like, negative attitude towards these words and this context of teaching. At the same time, he's providing with initiate, which is kind of much more positive. So maybe he just like trying to say as a good point that actual teachers should be the one who initiates 
and who educate people rather than preach them and control it? Yeah, I think in the earlier ones it starts out more neutral, although one choice, even there, you know, there's a sort of hint of authoritarianism, right? In an authoritarian society, you have one choice, right? Um, with the bodies such dust, ashes, dirt, grit, smut. To me, this feels like greater religious um, notions of what the body is. So here, you know, it's framed as being, being neutral, but I think increasingly it gets critical. Um, yeah, uh, and what's the volume of, of this? Uh, it, it, it's what? It's, it's a novel? It's, uh, it's framed as a novel or a collection of short stories. Okay. I guess it's kind of hard to say. But I mean, there, there's a progression to it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is like the first section is mm -hmm. this sort of type of exercise. Mm -hmm. The next section is sort of like this, where he gives five sentences and you have to put mm -hmm. them in order. Mm -hmm. Right? So you dream that you lose a child, you wake up, you cry, you lose a child, you cry, and you have, the reader has to put them in order. So it's sort of making narratives for yourself. And then the last, uh, the next section is um, like fill in the blank. Yeah? So you were a bad son, but something, you were a bad father, but something, you were alone, but something. So people vote for you, I love you, I'm not your father, you know it, no one knows. Right? So um, there are humorous. There are humorous, but also dark. Yeah. So I, I think that um, he's, he's very interesting because it, it is playful, but it's also like very political, very politically engaged. Um, I think in this case, the form that he has chosen, the form of the test, is very deliberate, right? Because it's, it's matched with his idea of how does the education system relate to the po politics of Chile. So um, I guess one of the takeaways that I want uh, I want you guys to take away, to put it very badly, is um, um, I really encourage you to experiment when you're writing, but I would also encourage you to ask, why am I doing this experiment? What is the role? What is the purpose? What is the effect? Right? Um, and to think about whether it fits, right? So in architecture, there is this um, phrase, form follows function, meaning the purpose of a building should relate to how it looks, how it's built, how it's constructed. And I think that there is something to be said about the form following function in literature as well. So let's think about, as we write, why we're making the choices we make and what they add or don't add um, to um, the story and how it affects it. Um, all right. So I want to leave you guys with a couple of exercises that you might do if um, maybe you want to try something new, but you're not uh, necessarily sure uh, what to do, what to try, you're sort of stuck. So one sort of basic thing might be to try writing the same scene from three different perspectives. So we tried that a little bit with the, um, like, write my commute in different styles. But this one could even be as simple as write it in the first person, write it in the second person, or you, or, and write it in the third person, like he, she, did. And see, what does that change? What are you able to include? in a first-person story that you can't include in a, in a third-person story, for instance, and vice versa. So get yourself to think about what are the limits of different styles, and how can you test them, and how can you make a, ch a right choice for each story that you're writing. Um, another thing that might be interesting as an exercise would be to try to narrate your own childhood in the style of the story girl that we read part of at the beginning. And to think about, you know, not just what lesson to include, but to think about how these lessons tell us about the characters, how these lessons tell, about, tell us about the relationship, right? So try to, to see how you can understand all of these things, again, without saying, you know, the girl was very shy with her mother, or the mother was very strict, right? So it's an exercise in indirect storytelling. Um, another thing I would encourage you guys to do would be to join the Saturday Book Club. I think I've mentioned it before, but um, I go every week. It's a ton of fun. Octan goes. A lot of us go. So um, it's really a great place to discuss literature and also to get books in English, right, which can sometimes be difficult to find, and to get recommendations. So if you want to join our WhatsApp group, um, I'm happy to sign you up for it um, after this. Um, 
And the last thing I would ask you for is to please consider signing up for one of the workshops, the student workshops here, where you guys share your work. Last time, we were honored to have Denise and Aptan share their work, and I think it was really fun. Next time, Marcel will be sharing something that she wrote, but we also have um, other slots available, including for um, our next session, which is after the break. So if you guys want to, um, you can send me a message, you can message the group, um, and I'll be happy to share the link for sign up second. Um, are there any questions? Yeah. What's the schedule? What, when and where is it? So it's, it's, for the book club, it's always Saturdays at 12, um, on the couches on the second floor. So if you want to join, there. yeah, exactly. There. So if you want to join the group, I'll be happy to like message you with the details. Um, but I really encourage you all to come. It's an always an interesting discussion. Um, and then the student workshops are always here on Wednesdays, the same time. So it's um, so it's every other session. So it sort of alternates between talks like this and then student workshops. And, uh, same time. Yep, same time, same place. Any other questions? Or comments? No? So I will share links to some of the stories or, or uh, novels that we read um, in our WhatsApp group so that you guys can continue reading if you're interested. And then we will put up the video from this if you, you're interested as well. But um, thank you guys for coming and it was uh, really a pleasure to hear your thoughts. Thank you. 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 Thank you.